Hello, and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. I'm your host, Ron Rivers. It's Friday, November 22nd, 2019, and on this week's episode, we're going to be discussing two major topics. The first is the inevitability of the impeachment process and the arguments for and against it. I'm going to weigh in on both sides, uh, share perspectives that I've heard uh, from my fellow progressive network, uh, and share my own personal perspective on it. Uh, as well as a new study uh, from the Brookings Institute about artificial intelligence and its impact on our high-skilled labor force. This has tremendous uh, potential to reshape society in ways that aren't all positive, uh, which is why I want to kind of dive deep on it. Both of these topics really do deserve uh, some deep consideration and exploration from really multiple perspectives, which is exactly what we're going to do today. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. So we'll start with impeachment. And, you know, as you're probably already aware, if you've been tuning in, I I tend to stay away from the impeachment inquiry only because there's so much news about it from so many different perspectives. However, I I do feel that even within the the movement, uh, the progressive movement, there are disagreements on the topic. So I thought it was important, given that this process is going to happen, um, to, to kind of dive deep into it. With Sondland's testimony this past week, Trump's traditional defenses have essentially come crumbling down. Um, one of the men on the inside has come forth to say that, without question, there was an intent to bribe a foreign power to interfere in American elections. At this point, it's, it's not a matter of if the impeachment hearings are going to happen, but really when they are going to happen. Impeachment is a controversial topic. It's it's not just between Republicans and Democrats, it's progressives as well. Um, They also vary and disagree about the effectiveness of the process. Critics of the process will say it's a distraction, uh, and and that is true, right? We can't deny that there are absolutely things today that the United States is turning a blind eye to. Uh, For example, like the coup in Bolivia. Um, a climate catastrophe that we're just not acting rapidly enough on, uh, and, and many other things. So the argument that it's a distraction from larger issues is true. I, I'm not denying that. Really, everywhere we turn now, there's a crisis. But to the opposite extent, we, we can't ignore the crisis within our own house. Our ability to help the world is severely weakened by the illegal activities of the current president. Another argument is that the impeachment is possibly pointless and, and also possibly harmful. Um, and I would say that you know it's, it's possibly true, but not a definite yes just yet. It is entirely possible that the impeachment process will not pass in the Senate. Will Republicans choose to die on the Trump Hill? I'm not so sure of that at the moment. It's one thing to be on the wrong side of history, but it's another to actively support someone who's being turned upon by an increasing number of their own high-level confidants. Could it harm the potential Democratic opposition? I don't really think so. You know, it's my perspective that Trump's core base is unreachable for the time being. Uh, eventually, as progressives especially, we're going to have to kind of bridge that gap and develop policies that are inclusive and pluralistic, including to the disenfranchised white working class. Um, obviously, there's many disenfranchised classes uh, and, and minorities that have been historically discriminated against, um, but we can't deny that that's what the liberals of the early 2000s and 1990s, that's what got us into the Trump mess, is ignoring this, this part of America. But the ones who are going to support him independent of his crimes, they're, they're just not realistic concerns. Their vote is a known future. And in many respects, it might as well be the past. It's already happened, right? There's nothing we can do about that. That middle of the road voter, though, the the person who voted for Trump but really could have gone either way, they just thought Trump was going to shake things up, um, which I guess they were right, right? Um, I think many of them will be swayed by the impeachment. This week was a brutal week for Trump. His defenses are being picked apart one by one, each testimony becoming more damning than the one before it. Now, one narrative that I reject is that Trump voters are idiotic or dumb uh, for voting for Trump. Trump voters, especially those middle-of-the-road voters, 
voted for Trump in what they would believe would be their best interest. Um, the fault really lies within all of us for not demanding a better system of providing information to the public. You know, at the end of the day, these people are from rural, uh, non-diverse communities where the only thing they care about is putting food on the table, right? These, uh, a, a general standard of living that is mildly acceptable and, and free of strife. And they thought, you know, after being ignored by so many years from the you know, existing liberal establishment, uh, the machine kind of corporate Democrats, that Trump was an option out. Now, of course, they were incorrect. Um, but I don't, you know, we, we shouldn't diminish their humanity for making a bad decision. Um, we should recognize the, the kind of chaos and we should recognize the uncertainty that put them in that decision in the first place. Um, and that's why when they come around, which I believe they will, progressives owe them a, a great deal of listening and action, really, to help them in the process of reformation. And that's really, I mean, this is not about Bernie Sanders, but it's just another reason why Bernie Sanders is the ideal reform candidate. Um, no person has a policy agenda as deep as Bernie Sanders when it comes to raising the floor for millions of forgotten Americans. Of course, there's also the argument that the impeachment won't pass and it's a waste of time. Um, but I, I do disagree with that. And I want to kind of transition into, into why the impeachment matters. The, the concept in the argument of impeachment matters is, is kind of a, a discussion that has to extend beyond the immediate presence. And we're going to get a little, a little meta here because a lot of this has to do with time and circumstance. But the choice to adhere to the rule of law, even when it seems pointless, is the correct choice. And, and I'll talk a little bit about, uh, I'll illustrate this with an example from my all-time favorite TV show, which is Star Trek. And one of my favorite aspects of Star Trek is the techno-political aspect. How society is organized and how technology facilitates that way of being, that, that organization that they choose. A big part of the Star Trek journey is the, the commitment to a vision larger than oneself. In this scenario, it's the Federation and really the prime directive, which is what they would call their core set of values and rules that everyone who joins Starfleet must adhere to. And you know, one of their series, Star Trek has many spin-offs if you're not familiar, but one of their series uh, was titled Voyager. It was the um, first female captain, uh, Captain uh, Catherine Janeway. And Voyager was all about remaining true to the ideals that we seek to become in times of extreme stress. And I use that language intentionally, right? You know, ideals are things that we, we strive to be. They're never situated in the present moment. They're, they're not what we are today. They're what we believe we can be and, and really know we can be with enough transformative effort uh, from you know, really a, usually a collective effort or independent, uh, depending on how, you know, what ideals you're striving for. You, the episode in, in the series is about not breaking or giving in to the pressures of the immediate moment. Even when things look really bad, and the effort may be pointless, pointless in the fact that it may not work out in the desired outcome. It's about believing in the efforts and not the results. This is a, by the way, this is a, a philosophy that you, you can compare with any professional athletes, uh, professional CEOs, professional activists. It's all about the, the effort. Uh, people who have been involved in these type of organizations understand um, that it doesn't matter the results, the results in, in many respects may be out of your control. What matters is the effort that you put in prior to the results. And then over time, if you keep investing, even if you constantly fail, you will surpass your limits. You see, the, the future is always unknown and it's always going to be unknown. And that can be pretty scary. It can make you feel anxious, distrustful, or you know, really dismissive of the entire impeachment process in the, in the case we're talking about. And sometimes, and I'll reference uh, Captain Picard of the Enterprise, you can do everything right and still lose. That's life. I'll add that even with that possibility, it doesn't excuse us from the, the obligation to put a genuine effort towards making the right decision in the moment. 
I challenge you to look at impeachment as a choice of a specific direction of departure. Where will we be when we begin recovery as a people? What is the foundation that we're going to be working with and working from? We have to grapple with the choice of whether or not we follow the law. President Trump broke the law. That's a key aspect of this impeachment inquiry. And I'll address critics proactively. It, you know, you don't need hard evidence to demonstrate intent. Um, the impeachment hearings are you know, all of his inner circle is testifying that, you know, no, his intent was to bribe Ukraine. That's enough to break the law. You don't need hard evidence. So that's that's not it. And also you don't need to commit a crime, right? The intent of bribery is enough uh, to be a constitutional violation. Um, so you don't need to actually have him doing it to, to be a crime. So he has committed a crime. Uh, that is a fact. So again, it comes back to, are we going to choose to follow the law or not? It sets a tone for history and for points of reference, really in the future generations may look back upon as a source of information. Not impeaching Donald Trump is a choice not to enforce the laws. Now I admit our laws aren't perfect. Many of them are actively detrimental to the progress of society. And there's no doubt about it that the laws are absolutely biased towards the poor and minorities. And what I mean by that is there's two sets of justice uh, for the rich and for the poor. The rich uh, get treated much, much better in our system of justice. But the precedent set by inaction will be too great a hurdle to overcome for future generations of ourselves and future versions of ourselves, really. There's no such thing as a neutral choice. Every decision pushes us towards a certain direction. Inaction, or not impeaching in this case, is a definitive step towards a change in the way that we enforce laws in this country. One that normalizes Trump's behavior and throws open the door for future bad actors. And we can even farther kind of dive into this, uh, into the implications of time. You know, right, in his lectures, Alan Watts talks about time and he illustrates the idea of time by comparing it to a ship moving forward through the ocean. As the ship moves forward, it leaves a wake behind it, right? Disturbance behind the ship. That wake is the past. We can only ever be wherever we are at any given moment of time. It's the eternal now, right? That is our existence. And the underlying theme is that we're always starting from right now, this moment in time. That's why choosing impeachment is the correct move, independent of the outcome. It's not to say that impeachment might be a waste of time. It may be, I'm, I'm not denying that. It's not to say that it, it may get shut down in the Senate, it, it most likely will. I'm not denying that. But what I am saying is despite all the negative possibilities and all the negative aspects, which I agree that there are many, at the end of the day, some choices don't have good, good options. You, you're only faced with two options that are incomplete uh, or not adequate. But in this case, I would argue firmly, and I would you know, suggest that you consider this, that impeachment is the path forward and is really the only path forward for progressives uh, because it is adherence to the law. And if we do not adhere to the law now, in this time, even if it's just a dog and pony show, even if it's just to say, look, we did the right thing when the right thing was called upon, then we have no right to demand justice in other aspects. We can't pick and choose the laws we want to enforce. Um, we can certainly change them, but when it comes to the president of the United States, you're quite literally talking about the most powerful man in the nation, uh, which is exactly why we must move forward with impeachment. I want to take a second to make a quick plug. MoveOn.org um, is organizing impeach Trump rallies across the nation. I believe there's over 250 rallies already, possibly over 300 by the time this releases. And these rallies are show solidarity across the nation that we won't stand for a lawless president. Um, they're, uh, they're all over the place. Full disclosure, I am hosting one in, in my hometown of New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, but I, I do recommend that you, you get involved and show up because you know what? It's, even if you're not a big activist, even if you're not into that stuff, just being there shows solidarity with other people, shows people that you are, are aligned with the majority of the United States at this point who believe that Trump did break the law uh, and a lawless president should be impeached. The, the repercussions of not impeaching are too great 
uh, and too far reaching into an unknown future to deny. So again, I stand firm on that impeachment is the right decision. If you disagree, please feel free to post in the comments uh, section below and you know, we'll chat about it. We'll discuss it because I want to hear what you're, you have to think. Um, and I'd like to hear what you think about my arguments about why it is so important to impeach. Now, moving on, the Brookings Institute released a report this week on the impact of artificial intelligence on high skilled labor. The key takeaway from their report is that the developments in artificial intelligence may have a greater effect on high skilled jobs and high tech knowledge regions. Um, the, the report was done by Stanford PhD candidate Michael Webb, who used essentially he used artificial intelligence to study artificial intelligence. I thought it was a, a really neat concept. His machine learning algorithm searched U.S. patents to identify the capabilities of artificial intelligence technology, repetitive but technical tasks like, for example, medical diagnosis. The study notes fully 740 out of 769 occupational descriptions Michael Webb analyzed contain a capability pair match with AI patent language, meaning at least one or more of its tasks could potentially be exposed to, complemented by, or completed by artificial intelligence. Now, I want to make a clarifying statement about this report, uh, because especially if you're not, if you're not a big tech junkie, I, you know, like I personally really enjoy reading technology news. It's like my daily coffee read. Oftentimes we hear artificial intelligence and we think about robotics. But robotics have already been the bane of the manufacturing industry. And typically what we would consider low skilled and highly transferable labor are the ones who are most impacted. Think about, for example, um, a, a person on a, an assembly line who is examining widgets. Um, a machine can do that better, faster, and more accurately than a person ever could. Something that we would already historically have been handled by a person has for the most part, you know, really already been replaced by robots in a lot of instances. Another example is Amazon's automated warehouses. According to Amazon, um, full automation is about a decade away, but they're already quickly automating parts of their fulfillment process as the technology is invented or discovered. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are more about software devices that can self-learn. By repeating the tasks millions of times and observing the trends in different outcomes, the artificial intelligence can teach itself new pathways of action. And that's why the technology is so threatening to what we would traditionally be called high skilled labor, people with advanced degrees and knowledge. The report shows that a number of low skilled occupations rank highly in their potential to be disrupted as well. It's not just um, high skilled labor, for example, farming, manufacturing, mining, and construction um, are all you know, prone to disruption but also exposed to high skill jobs like professional uh, scientific and technical services, information services like IT, um, financial services, you know, insurance, uh, and really I would say government as well, right? Really an administrative AI would do wonders for the United States. The study says high tech digital services such as software publishing and computer system design that in the past have had low automation susceptibility now exhibit quite high exposure as AI tools and applications kind of pervade the technology sector. And one interesting note is that because of this skewed representation that exists today in high skilled technical work, that the AI uh, revolution is, is more likely to impact the employment status of male, white, and Asian American workers aged from 25 to 64. So what does this report mean for society and how do we approach it from a progressive perspective? Well, it highlights what we already know to be a growing problem here in the United States, one that's only going to get worse over time. Unfortunately, the present economic and legal arrangements really don't offer solutions to this inevitable crisis. Now, with that said, there is an alternative, a method to reshape this problem into an incredibly positive solution. Pulling from Roberto Mangiabera Unger's Six Pillars of Progressive Transformation, we address this issue by opening up uh, the most advanced forms of production. So let's pull that phrase apart for a moment. 
under our current legal structure, the owners of AI, that same AI that is going to wipe out hundreds of thousands of high-skilled jobs, uh, are, are going to reap tremendous benefits from this transition. High-skilled labor isn't cheap, especially because in many respects, it's highly transferable. A good doctor can work at any hospital and still be a good doctor. It doesn't matter where they're working. A good developer, right, someone who writes code, can work at any firm and write code that's good uh, because they are skilled in their profession. And that's because being highly skilled in today's knowledge economy environment means both developing the skill set and the habits necessary to apply your talents in different ways while retaining your core competencies. But if you're a medical practitioner and an algorithm can do a better job of diagnosing illness than you ever could, your talent is suddenly rendered a little less relevant. We're never going to avoid a dystopian future that further concentrates wealth to the already wealthy at the expense of the middle and lower classes if we refuse to reimagine how technology is treated in the United States. Unger's argument is that we follow the industrial age model and disseminate the best technology and practices involve the most advanced companies, what would be called knowledge economy companies, to everyone. Knowledge economy companies are companies that have innovation and creativity tied into every stage of their activity. It's not just high tech that makes a company earn the title of operating within the knowledge economy. And I'll present two contrasting examples to prove that point. Um, at Alphabet's Google, employees have the ability to work on side projects unrelated to their established role. So uh, they can work there, get paid, and work on projects that excite them, that they want to work on, that aren't part of their job description. Now, these projects can be in whatever direction the employee prefers. People are encouraged and rewarded for being creative. This is a company model that will always perpetuate innovation. Walmart is the opposite example. Walmart has access to high technology in, in a number of different operations within the company. But tech doesn't make you a knowledge economy company. Your process does as well. Walmart's structure is incredibly rigid and hierarchical, right? It's like a pyramid, like traditional businesses are. Innovation doesn't happen within Walmart. It happens outside of Walmart and then is brought into the business model by purchasing it. That's the big difference. Does the company tie innovation into its standard practice or not? Now, I also want to talk briefly about knowledge economy companies and, and why they need to be regulated from a different perspective. Today, companies are reaching monopoly faster uh, than ever before. And not only that, but they're maintaining monopoly. Knowledge economy companies have the unique ability to, once they reach the threshold of monopoly, they can maintain it because again, going back to that Google example, when you tie innovation at every level into your process, you're constantly coming up with new forms of products. So compare that to traditional economics. Traditional economics um, and innovation about your know, continuing growth focus on the demand side. It's an idea that works well in theory, but not so great in practice. Another thing about knowledge economy companies that have innovation tied into their core structure is that they are able to, to, to achieve monopoly faster and then maintain that monopoly. Uh, because innovation is constantly happening within the company, there are you know, a near seemingly infinite directions of innovation that they could move to if they wanted to. Um, and, and that generates even more capital to hire even more talent and the, the cycle repeats itself. Compare that again to Walmart where innovation happens externally is brought in. Um, Walmart doesn't have the capacity to perpetually be on the cutting edge of technology. Uh, which is why it can never be a, a, a real knowledge economy company. Today, we face a real challenge when it comes to the concentration of new technology, process, and patents staying in the hands of the already powerful organizations. They remain inaccessible to the majority of American companies and entrepreneurs. So if we understand the nature of work is changing and that innovation and imagination are key ingredients in that change, it would make sense to try and make every American company as innovative as possible, giving them the tools to advance themselves while allowing cooperatives to experiment in whatever directions they think are best with the technology. Essentially, we want to open up access to technology here in the United States and significantly raise the floor 
for being innovative within our economy. Everyone starts from the highest possible combination of technology and practice. Combined with continued education and training efforts, we turn the direction of the United States economy back into one of explosive growth. And by the way, history supports this suggestion. Think back to the Industrial Revolution. The technology and machinery needed to operate the most advanced form of work at that time, which was mass production, was available to any entrepreneur seeking it. The latest automated looms, widget machines, etc., all and more for the taking. Imagine going to Google today and asking them if you could have access to the most advanced machine learning information they have to develop your products in a different direction than they're doing. You'd be laughed out of the building, but you wouldn't be wrong. It would be better for the United States economy and the workforce if you had access to those resources. Today, the isolation of technology is stagnating the United States economy. Don't be fooled by job numbers, GDP, or the stock market. We are not innovating to the same degree as evidenced by stagnating startup investment numbers. On that note, every once in a while you hear these huge venture capital investments, right? They get really exciting. But venture capital is a very small part of economic activity in the United States. It is simply not enough to fund the plethora of game-changing ideas out there. Laws that would open up access to the best technology, policy, and practice could be enacted in a number of ways. One policy I developed when I ran for state assembly was to create programs where the state's best companies had to develop training programs to help provide sources of continuing education for people. To quote Unger again, the best firms become the best schools. Now this policy is radically different than anything else available in the state today, or really any states, but that's exactly the kind of policy that progressives should be putting forth. It takes a bird's eye view of our circumstance and says, hey, the current path is unsustainable, but most of the ideas being proposed don't do enough to transform the system. Most, even on the progressive side, are some form of redistributive effort. And redistribution is an important part of this process, but it is not the end goal. Patent reform should be at the top of the list as well. Too many companies today hold innovative technologies hostage, unused, and serve no purpose. Again, I want to stress that if we're really committed to overcoming material scarcity in society, then we need to perpetuate growth in our economic activity in a new direction. We cannot continue on the current pathway, doing the same things that we have done historically and expect to avoid the major unemployment crisis that is clearly visible on the horizon. That means reshaping the very institutions that drive our economic engine. And it makes total sense right now. Imagine you thought of the United States like a giant machine. Right now, the majority of the parts in this economic machine are totally outdated. A very small part of the machine, you have constant innovation, constant reinvention. So much so that those parts in that small section of the machine are generations beyond in their practice and procedure than the other ones. Our economic woes aren't going to be solved by new forms of taxation, although that is certainly part of it. They require imagination. Ultimately, that's what being progressive is about. It's a new way of thinking about change. And that's what we need today. More imagination in our institutions to address what we know is on the horizon. Thanks again for listening to the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report.